to Make Code Live with John Park. It's me, John Park. Uh, and I want to thank you for tuning in and stopping by for some more fun and hopefully exciting Make Code action. Uh, apologies to anyone who got confused by my blog post. I said uh, the wrong date. I said it was the 20th, Tuesday, the 25th, which doesn't exist, as someone pointed out over in Discord, so thank you for that. Uh, yeah, it's today, Tuesday, the 26th of May. I can't go making stuff up, apparently. Uh, you're going to catch me every time. All right, so uh, let's see. Before we go too far, um, I wanted to... Move some of this uh, stuff out of my face here. Oh, there we go. Oh, hold on. I've got some new features I'm excited to show inside of Make Code, as well as uh, here's a little preview of one feature, uh, as well as talk about using the Cricut Robotics Expansion Board, uh, the Cricut system. It's a it's a board that we can plug the micro bit uh, or the Circuit Playground Express or a Feather board into, even a Raspberry Pi. We have a few versions of the Cricut, uh, which allow us to uh, use the Make Code enabled controller or other other programs. You can use the Cricut with Circuit Python, I think Arduino. Uh, but we'll be looking at using Make Code and a micro bit with the Cricut system in order to do robotics like things which includes servo motors, uh, steppers, DC motors, lights, uh, sensors, buttons, potentiometers, uh, electromagnets, solenoids, all kinds of things that you uh, often want to use in your projects. And these don't have to be sort of traditional moving around kind of robots. These are all of the mechanisms that you'll find yourself using with lots of other projects uh, from escape room thingies to puzzle boxes uh, to robot arms to actual mobile robots. Uh, there's a lot you can do using a robotics platform like the Cricut. So we're going to take a look today at how you do that right inside of Make Code, which is really exciting, a really fun way to get, uh, get a robotics type of project up and running. Um, I will also say hello to uh, everyone over in the various chats. Hello, uh, we got some people in the YouTube chat. Uh, hey, Charles Burnerford. Hey, Via Soluciones. Uh, Rokaya, DeAndre Goldburn. Welcome, Raspberry Pi Dude. Hello. Uh, yeah, Raspberry Pi Dude 314 says, uh, yes, Adafruit is shipping orders now. That's correct. So if you have been waiting on... Uh, ordering some things from Adafruit. Adafruit is now shipping. Um, so let's see. The next thing I want to do is, before we get uh, into the bulk of, of the, uh, the live stream today, is I want to show a uh, Make Code team member video. I've been uh, doing these for a few weeks now where we get a two or three minute uh, vlog style video from one of the members of the Make Code team. Uh, so with no further ado. Hello world, I'm Daryl, an engineer on the MakeCode team. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some work we're doing for the language services features uh, for Python and JavaScript. So the language service is a set of enhancements we make to the text editing experience uh, that uh, make it a little easier to work with code than just writing plain text would. So there's five main features uh, that we have that I'm going to talk about real quick. So one is global and local completion. So if you just start typing code, you will see a bunch of suggestions on um, possible APIs or other variables you might have in your program that match what you're typing. And um, that is called global and local completion. So once you uh, type a dot, you'll see the, an even more filtered list. And what this is, is these are all the members on a particular object or namespace. In this case, the input namespace. You see all these different APIs available here. And this is a really great way to discover APIs that you might not otherwise know about. Um, and so you can search for APIs in the input namespace or the basic namespace or uh, basically anywhere else. And once you've um, found something that you want, you can hit the enter key to uh, trigger an autocomplete. So 
autocomplete in the case of event handlers will generate a function uh, and uh, pass that function into the, um, the event handler registration. So what this means is that um, you get a little bit of starter code that works and isn't going to give you errors. And so this can be a really big help um, when you're not quite sure how to use uh, a, an API. Uh, the autocomplete can, can give you something that will generally get you close. Um, the fourth type of help is hover help. So when you hover over uh, different bits of code, you can learn about them. So here we see a description of what the on button pressed event does and uh, what the um, the na input namespace kind of uh, does. And this can be really helpful when um, reading someone else's code or sample code or um, just kind of trying to um, figure out how, how things work. A fifth type of way that the language service can help is when um, you're filling out a function. So let's say I'm typing out here in a show string, and you can see this pop up here that tells you the um, for the current parameter you're on, some context for that parameter, as well as all the parameters available uh, for this particular method. So you've probably used um, you know, show string with hell, uh, a string, but you probably didn't know that you can actually pass a number here as well. And as you do, uh, that changes the, the behavior of, of show string. And that's an optional parameter uh, that you can discover by using um, the parameter help. All right, that's been it for now. Thanks for watching. Very cool stuff. Thank you, Daryl, for that video. It was uh, really well done. And uh, I'm excited about some of these features. I was just playing around with the Python uh, coding side of make code yesterday a little bit and uh, was really impressed using this, this current version, uh, all of the uh, code completion and help. Uh, you can get even some debugging help in there. Uh, it's really fantastic. Uh, I'll also check and see, I was just checking in, someone said that uh, maybe my volume level was too low. Uh, I want to avoid clipping because sometimes this setup the way I have was clipping on me. So, so let me know if that's still uh, too quiet. I'll try to push that up a little bit. I'm afraid, uh, afraid to get clipping going. Oh, let's, let's try it there. How about that? Maybe that's better. Uh, yeah, maybe there. All right. So, uh, one other new feature, I mentioned this and showed a little hint of it that uh, I'll talk about. I'm using the microbit make code for this project today. And uh, one, uh, I'm using the beta. So if you, if you uh, type in the normal make code address, in this case, I'm using makecode.microbit.org, uh, and then type in slash beta, you'll use the beta version of it. And there are other ways up in the um, little gear icon up here, I think, to, to pick your version. But in the beta, and I don't know if this is in release yet, but in the beta, you'll notice that we now have uh, block collapsing capabilities, which is fantastic. Uh, I think some of them will show, maybe, no, I don't, I don't know if always it'll show. Sometimes I think it shows the, uh, the icon on there. Uh, sometimes it doesn't when it's in the pre-collapsed mode, but you can just right click on a block and say collapse block. And this is a really nice way to hide some stuff. It doesn't change the functionality of things, but it allows you to hide some stuff when you're, when you're working. It's really um, terrific. The uh, per block collapsing works like this. You can also right click in the canvas and choose collapse blocks and it'll collapse them all. Or you can click, uh, right click on the canvas and choose expand blocks and it'll expand them all. This is fantastic. I love this. It'll make it'll make uh, everything so much more nicely organized when when you're working. I, I appreciate that addition. Uh, looks like Charles Burniford. Hello, Charles says over in YouTube chat. Uh, good, and I and I think that may be in reference to the volume, or you just really like the collapse feature. One of those. Uh, okay, so I mentioned uh, that today I want to talk about cricket. So let me show you just a. Uh, picture of what, what I'm talking about. This is the cricket. Um, let's see, do I have a, there we go. 
So this is the Cricut for micro bit. And you can see from this, uh, let me go to a side view or a little down diagonal view. You can see that it has the edge connector for the micro bit. My micro bit pops right in there. All of the pins along the bottom of the micro bit are now routed to where they need to go to talk with the, with the board, with the seesaw uh, uh, chip that's on the Cricut that um, sends over I squared C, I believe it is, information uh, back and forth to different ports. And uh, there it is without the micro bit in it. Looking at this top view, you can see it's, it's pretty well labeled for what, what you can use. Um, the primary issue being you can't just plug motors into your typical microcontroller and expect much to happen because the microcontroller doesn't provide a lot of current. Uh, so that's one of the things that the Cricut does is it provides a bunch of current available on these uh, drive pins here, which are um, used for things like solenoids and electromagnets, um, even bright LEDs. The uh, motor port over here will do stepper motors and DC motors. Uh, then there's a speaker port, a NeoPixel port, these little capacitive touch sensors along the bottom left. On the left side are all these uh, signal I.O. ports, which allow you to do things like plug in potentiometers and buttons and, and sliders and uh, some sensors. And then the upper left corner, there's a four, set of four servo uh, driver connections. It has its own power. So, so I've got five volts plugged in either on a battery pack or from a wall wart, uh, which is important because we're using, uh, in many cases, a two amp or a four amp uh, wall wart, or you can get quite, quite a bit of current out of a set of alkaline batteries. Um, and that means that we're able to drive motors and things that are really power hungry without causing any problems to the board. Otherwise, you'll, you'll sometimes cause boards to reset or brown out. Uh, so that's what the Cricut looks like um, in, the, in the real world there. Uh, let's actually take a look now at the one I have set up here. So uh, I've taken, this was fun to build. I took a, uh, a Cricut board with the micro bit plugged into it. And I've got a little cute micro bit case on there that helps the LEDs uh, look a little more readable on, on video. Uh, and you can see here, I've got a bunch of stuff plugged in. I have a DC motor here and this uh, wire plugs into a couple of the uh, motor ports here. This is a, I believe it's a H-bridge uh, motor driver, which means we can go forward and reverse. It can flip the current uh, positive and negative. So that allows us to drive forward and reverse on that motor. Um, we could actually have two of those plugged in, which is typical for, for stuff like a little Rover robot. Uh, you'll also see I've got a potentiometer here plugged in and I've routed that wire under the board a little bit to, to keep things looking neat, but that is plugged into one of these uh, signal power ground uh, slots, as is this button. And these are actually little pre-made uh, JST connector breakouts for a button and a potentiometer, which make them very easy to use. Um, we've also got a solenoid plugged in here. So this is a little, no, you can't see me. I'm covering that up, sorry. This is a little clicker uh, solenoid. You can use these to strike an object. These are used sometimes to lock boxes and doors and things like that. Uh, that is plugged into one of my driver ports here. And I have a, uh, I'm also using the driver port to, to drive an electromagnet, which I have sort of somewhat uh, unusual connection there. This electromagnet is connected to a little popsicle stick, which is on a servo motor. So the servo will be able to move forward and backward. The electromagnet I can um, uh, power or, or not, uh, charge or not, so it can grab hold of things magnetically. Uh, and I think that's all I've got plugged into it. So um, let's take a look now at how you actually use an electromagnet, or an electromagnet, a cricket uh, with, with uh, make code inside of uh, my session here. So the first thing I needed to do was head to advanced uh, over in the make code interface. And down at the bottom is a section called extensions. And here I picked the Cricut extension. Again, this disappears once you've added it, so you won't see mine, but you'll see up towards the top, there's, a, there's an extension called Cricut. So I added that in. And when I added that in, it changed the interface by placing this section here that says Cricut. This shows up. Now I have a whole bunch of added functionality that allows me to drive the motors and turn the servos and uh, read buttons and, and switches and so on. 
Uh, all of those are pretty simple to use, uh, self-explanatory for the most part, uh, blocks. And so what we'll do is we'll explore using those and also how to set up a, a program that allows us to use some of these at the same time uh, in some cases or with um, some elegant controls for things like the motor speed and direction using our potentiometer. Uh, so let's start with, if I, if I take a look at my on start block here, um, the first thing I'm doing in my program is I have a kind of a debug mode here. Uh, if false and then something happening. Whenever you see that if false and it comes out of this uh, logic, starts, starts out life as if true, but I've changed it to if false. Uh, so essentially this means don't do what's inside of this block, but that means I can use this as uh, a sort of debugging switch to turn on and off this statement. And in fact, in, in this case, if we look at the simulator, uh, and I'll restart the program. If you watch the lights here, it writes out the word cricket. Kind of like Daryl was showing in that, uh, in that video from the Microsoft team, there's a um, show string block here, which is a stock make code block for micro bit that allows you to display some text uh, and numbers as a string. So I wanted it to boot up and show that string uh, for fun and to test things out, but it also meant that I was waiting around for that to go by and I got tired of it. So I added this little debug mode, which when I set it to false, you see when it starts up, it doesn't do that. Uh, okay. So let me, let me minimize that simulator. Um, so the next thing I'm doing is I have a variable called angle and I'm setting it to 180. And this is something I'm going to use for my, uh, servo motor because servo motors, are essentially a motor that can go from zero to usually 180 degrees. Uh, so you can tell them where to go and they arrive at that location and they stop. Uh, they have servo control, which means that the uh, controller can, can uh, specify where it's sending the motor to uh, and the motor sends back its position and then it stops when those, when those numbers agree. Uh, so the next thing I'm doing is I'm setting the servo one, so there are four servos I can plug into the cricket board. I'm setting it to an angle of 180. In fact, I could have used, why don't we, I could use my, uh, my variable there, set it to the angle to begin with. Oh, and by the way, here's another snazzy new feature. Look at this. When you are deciding where to place a block, sometimes it could be a little tricky to know uh, where you were going to place that block. Now we get this great little helper. Uh, I don't know what they call this, but there's this little um, what do we call it? Tractor beam. That's what I'm going to call it. There's a little tractor beam that pops up and says, this is where you're going to go and whoop, drop it and plops in there. I really like that. Uh, next we set the, uh, motor to be inverted. So I have this, uh, DC motor, the yellow motor plugged in. And when you tell the motor to go forward, uh, or backward a certain value, depending on how you plug it in, it can be plugged in either way. Forward may, be, may mean reverse. So if you want to flip that over, just usually through trial and error, you can either rewire it or you can be lazy and, and just use this uh, little bit of software block here. Uh, the next thing I'm doing is I'm showing the LEDs in this little pattern. So this shows a little check mark on there that means all systems are go, we're A-OK. -okay. Um, and then we have essentially two other types of uh, things happening in here. I have a couple of button presses, so I can, I can press an input to make something happen. Or inside of my forever block, I call some functions that I've made already. Uh, so if we expand, let's say the solenoid uh, function, this is, a, this is a nice one to take a look at. Uh, and let me collapse the blocks that I don't need. I'm very happy with this new functionality. Uh, so the forever block just means while the program, the main loop of the program is going, it's just going to repeatedly call these functions. And what those uh, different functions do, we'll take a look at now, the solenoid function, uh, it reads the cricket touch sensor one. Get this out of my face here. There we go. Uh, so the touch sensors are these capacitive touch sensors here, one, two, three, and four. Uh, and so we read them and we're checking for a value. The value on those can range for, I think, from zero to 100, uh, 1,023. 
And so I'm looking for, I don't want accidental, I'm kind of near it. I want to be pretty certain I'm touching it because uh, capacitance is, is in a range. Um, so anytime that read is over 500, I'm pretty, pretty definitely touching it. Um, this may vary depending on how you have your uh, system grounded, how things are set up. So sometimes you'll need to change that, that value. Uh, what happens then is if I'm not touching it, nothing else inside of this function happens and we just move on with life and look at the other functions. Uh, but when I do touch it, here's, here's what happens. We call the cricket analog write drive number two. So let's look at cricket categories. Uh, so we have servos, motors, here's the drives. And so this is the thing that can drive uh, heavy current five volt things such as servos, bright LEDs and so on. Um, so I'm setting this Cricut analog write drive. I've dragged one of those blocks into here. I'm setting it to its top value, which is 1023. You can see we have a little slider here, if there's any doubt. And I happen to have my solenoid plugged into port number two here. So if you look, uh, there's a blue wire going into port one, and there's this yellow wire going into port two. So the blue wire is my electromagnet, and my yellow wire is this solenoid here that's going to click. Uh, I'm also setting a pixel color. So there's this uh, Neo pixel down in the bottom of the, of the cricket that we'll see light up. Uh, then I pause 200 milliseconds. So I wanna, I wanna charge the solenoid coil. It has an electromagnetic coil in there. I wanna charge that coil pretty short amount of time before I then set it back to zero. So this means we're gonna click and release. If we hold that um, for a long time, you can draw a ton of current and start to overheat things. So solenoids are very often made to be used uh, intermittently. We don't want to draw that, draw them uh, all that power for a long period of time. Uh, so then I'm also showing an icon just for fun. I just want to see an icon on the screen that gives me some feedback that something's changed. Uh, and then I'll set that pixel off. The, the light blue pixel will turn off. And then I'm also waiting uh, another short period of time so that if I hold my finger on it, I'm not going to be very quickly recharging it over and over again. Instead, I'll get kind of a little pulse. Uh, so let's test it out. Let's uh, I'll hold this up so you can see it a little better. So you can see that little plunger. And even if I hold my finger on it, you can see it's, it's going to pulse on and off. It's not going to stay out there. It's not going to very quickly pulse again. So that's my little uh, control that I'm implementing. And you can see also my icon changes so that I know sort of the last thing I did was the solenoid. I chose uh, a pre-made icon. There's a, there's a bunch of these little pre-made icons. Uh, I chose this sort of sword looking thing because it kind of reminded me of the plunger on there. Uh, so that's the solenoid. And again, you can see that this is all contained inside of this one function, which I can now fold up. I'm, I'm done talking about that one. And if we go back and look at my forever loop, uh, that was one of three functions that we're running through over and over again. Um, so let's now take a look uh, at, how about the DC motor function? Um, so let me go find that. Whoop, let me get the right screen here. Let me go find the DC motor function and I'll open that up. And let's, uh, Let's find a good spot for it. How about right there? So this one, I have an if else statement as the first thing that happens. So if my, uh, essentially I, what I wanna do is find a center point on the uh, potentiometer, this knob that I'm gonna turn somewhere near the middle. And I don't want it to be too hard to find that middle. I wanna give it a little bit of a, a neutral zone there. Uh, I'm going to turn off the motor. Uh, so with these DC motors, you, you don't want them held and sort of, again, buzzing and drawing current, even though they're just barely moving. So what I want to do is actually stop the motor. And that is, if I look in the Cricut dropdown, we have a section here called motors, run motor. And we can pick uh, one of the, I think just two, right? One of the two motors. Yeah. Uh, we've got run motor at and a percentage. So that'll go anywhere from zero to 100% uh, in one direction and zero down to negative 100% in the other direction. That's how we can go forward and reverse or right and left. Um, so we have a run motor command. 
Uh, we have this tank motors command, which is fun if you're using a bot and you want to do things like turn right by having the wheels go in opposite directions. That's how you can uh, turn right in place, uh, sort of like tank tread skid steering. Uh, we have stop motor, which I just mentioned. That's what I'm going to use to say don't send any current to the motor at all uh, when we're stopped. And then this was that invert motor command that I used just to fix my wiring without having to unscrew anything. Um, by the way, I didn't mention this, but most of the ports on the Cricut here are screw terminals, which means you use a small screwdriver, uh, something like this, to loosen or tighten a little port where you plug a wire into. Uh, stranded wires work best, but I've found even the solid nail headers, header pins work pretty well. Uh, we got a question over on YouTube. What is this? This is Make Code Live. I'm showing the Make Code software, which you can find by going to makecode.com. Uh, the version I'm using is for microbit, and I'm showing how to use it uh, with a robotics platform called Cricket. Thanks for your question, Ashkat Sharma. Uh, so let's see before I uh, forget where I was going. What are we doing? So we're, we're checking to see, are we somewhere in this middle zone of the potentiometer? Now, the potentiometer runs a, a 0 to 1023. Uh, so that's this knob here plugged into one of these uh, eight I.O. ports. And when it's far turned far to the left, it should be returning an analog value of zero. And when it's far to the right, it should return a 1023. Uh, so I found uh, somewhat lazily, without wanting to do too much math, that somewhere between 500 and 600 is a decent dead zone or band in the middle. Uh, that's not mathematically exactly correct, but I, I threw it in there and it worked, so I've left it. Um, we could probably do something like 500 to 524, and that would be a little more exact. Um, so it'll stop the motor when we're in that zone. Then the else statement is anything else. So that means if the analog read isn't greater than 500 and less than 600, that means we're outside of that zone, one direction or another. I will, uh, again, for some feedback, I'm going to set my uh, pixel color to, to uh, yellow, so I'll turn that little LED to yellow. Uh, the motor will run, uh, I'm running motor one, and then what I'm doing is I'm remapping the values. So remember I said that the potentiometer, it's an analog read which returns a, a zero to 1023 uh, as its range. I wanna take that and remap it to negative 100% and positive 100%, which is the fully left or fully right on the motor. Um, and so that's what this remap uh, it's in the math drop down. So if we look in here, we can see map a number uh, that's coming in, in this case, from reading the, the uh, potentiometer, the knob. And there's its range, 0 to 1023. And then I'm saying from a low of negative 100 to a high of 100. So let's take a look at that in action. Let me, uh, let me move this out of the way. And you can see here now, as I turn this knob, We're head to the right, and you might see it'll go faster when I go fully right. And then I hit that little dead zone. You can see I can wiggle it a little in here and it's still stopped, which is why I set that up. And now we'll go to the left. Let's see how slow. These don't love to go super slow, so we'll see. It's usually around 20% of its speed is where it'll kick in. Needs a little current to get going. Uh, so there's fully left, dead zone, fully right, and somewhere in between. I'll stop again. Uh, and you also see I decided to pull up an icon uh, when we're in motion. I'm using this little baby carriage uh, <laughs> icon just for fun. Again, you could decide to uh, customize those by grabbing this show LEDs instead. If we drop that in here, uh, we can then set up a, a custom icon. Maybe it's more of a car looking thing. Um, so if we delete this block, sometimes it can be tricky to get rid of a block that's in a list. So if you try to move it, it will drag the things that are connected below it. Uh, so if I wanted to get rid of this, I could either delete the block or duplicate that group and peel it off. Uh, so 
let's live life dangerously and try to upload this updated code to the uh, microcontroller. You can see here I have um, this USB plug connected and this is not used for powering anything. The Cricut provides power to the micro bit uh, as well as to all the motors and things. Uh, so this is used currently just for, for coding it. Uh, so if I head down to the bottom, uh, let me see, can I resize this so you can see it? If I head down to the bottom here and click on download, uh, and I'm gonna put my hand here so you might see some blinking uh, LEDs that are telling us that it's being coded. So blink, 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 and it's done, it's updated. That's how fast it is. This is using web USB, uh, which works inside of the Chrome browser and I believe the Edge browser. Uh, so with WebUSB, we can actually send, uh, send the code to the microcontroller very simply and easily. And now you should see my new icon show up. So there's my little car icon. And we could even do something fancy like reverse the direction of the icon when we're going in different uh, motor directions. Okay, so that is our DC motor control. I think that covers everything that's going on in there. Uh, and then let's see, what else can we look at? Um, I'm just taking a look at the different uh, chats to make sure there's no questions or anyone telling me that my microphone has gone insane, but it hasn't, so that's good. Um, so next up, let's take a look at if we if we uh, go back, oops, let me head over here. Uh, if we go back and look at in our forever block, the other uh, um, function that I'm calling in here is the electromagnet. Um, yeah, let's... Let's take a look at the electromagnet uh, next. Then we'll take a look at the servo that it's connected to. So calling electromagnet. Uh, if, by the way, you have, if you have a hard time finding something, one thing you can do is right click and say format code. It sounds a little scary, but all it does is organizes and collects things into a little bundle, which is nice. Um, so that brought everything together. I know I don't have anything sort of far off on the canvas now. And uh, by the way, I learned that watching uh, one of the other Make Code live streams. I believe it was Pelly, one of the Make Code team members who was uh, working with either his son or his daughter. He does different live streams with them. And uh, he right clicked and chose Format Code. I had no idea that command was there and it's really nice for cleaning up and organizing things. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. It's one of the great reasons uh, to, to watch other people work live in, in some software you know as you learn a lot of things. Okay, so uh, the electromagnet is this one here. We'll pop that open. And now I'll move it off. Uh, how about here so we can look at it cleanly. And I'm going to move my uh, little demo board here so you can see this is the electromagnet. And when that function gets called, what we're doing is we're checking the status of this button here. This red button is plugged into port one up here of the uh, signal IO. And in port one, uh, sorry, in uh, port two, I lied, that says if not cricket uh, digital read signal two. So uh, the, by the way, let me, let me show you a little difference here. Analog read is what I'm using for that potentiometer. So it's checking for values from 0 to 1023. Digital read is what I use for a button. So that's either on or off. Either we're, we're uh, driving that uh, signal high or we're driving it low. And so uh, let's see, in this case, I believe it is always high, and when, which means there's, there's voltage present on that line. Until we press the button, then it drops down to ground. Um, so in this case, when the uh, button is pressed, that means that pin will read zero or low, which is why I'm saying if not, cricket digital read signal. So if you're ever trying to read a button with the if statement and it seems to op work opposite of how you envision, you can just flip that logic to ask for if not. So uh, where we're doing this, by the way, is in logic. Again, it's this conditional statement if true, and then we can look at these uh, comparisons, either uh, drop the item straight into it or add this not, and that will uh, invert that logic for us. So if it's not uh, being pulled high, that means I've pressed it. 
Uh, so then what we do is we set the analog drive, similar to how we use the solenoid, we're setting this electromagnet value to 1023. That means it's fully charging that magnet. I also turn on a pixel, I change my icon. And this one I'm holding, uh, I'm allowing, as long as I hold the button, it's gonna hold the charge. And then when I release the charge, that means that that uh, signal is red high. The analog drive will be written to a value of zero. So turn off the electromagnet and then we turn off our pixel. Uh, so let's um, minimize that, get these guys out of the way here. And so what you can see is when I press the button, it lights up this LED. So that's how I know I'm holding it and the fact I'm holding it, uh, but it's one way to know it's working, uh, especially because this one doesn't drive a motor or doesn't do something that you can see physically. It's just changing the electromagnetic current here. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold a little screwdriver bit and you'll see it doesn't wanna stick until I hold this. And now the screwdriver bit's being held. When I let go, it'll drop. So again, holding the charge, release, and it drops. So this is kind of fun for doing things like uh, releasing something, picking something up and moving it with a robot arm. And, and uh, I'm building up to that actually. I kind of built a little version of a robot arm using the servo motor. Uh, again, let me give you a better, better view of the, uh, the contraption from this angle. Here is my servo motor. It has a typical servo horn and I glued a big popsicle stick or tongue depressor to it. Uh, cut a little slot and a hole, and I added that electromagnet, which comes threaded and with a hole uh, with a screw in it. So uh, that's the electromagnet functionality. And now uh, what I want to do is show you how to use the servo motor, which is sort of part two of this. It's sort of a compound uh, little uh, assembly here, mechanism. Uh, so in the, again, in this cricket uh, category, I have the very first section here is for servos. So servos will be, uh, this is a typical hobby servo used often for uh, remote control airplanes for things like changing the flaps and rudders and ailerons for steering um, because they can move precisely to different angles. And uh, that plugs into this very specific servo area here, one, two, three, and four. And they have a common uh, data ground and, uh, sorry, data uh, voltage, positive voltage and ground uh, layout uh, that you can plug in. So that's just sort of an off the shelf hobby servo. And uh, when we use these blocks in the, uh, the Cricut library, the set servo angle to, uh, wants to be set anywhere from zero to 180 typically. Uh, there are other types of servos that don't stop. They're called continuous rotation servos. So that means they have no physical stops in them and setting their angle is akin to setting their speed and uh, either forward or backward speed. We're not using one of those here, so we'll ignore that block. And uh, we don't really need to worry about this one either. This is a, um, some servos want their data that's sent to them, which is a square wave. It's a little pulse wave to be at a uh, different duty cycle, a different width of those waves so that it can read the signal. Um, and so if you run into problems with a servo, you can adjust those values. You can also typically go online and read up on a, on a particular servo and see what type of pulse uh, timing does it want. So with, uh, let's click off of here for, for now. Uh, with that in mind, we're gonna use the A and B buttons that are built onto the micro bit. So this one and this one, to send the servo forward and backward. Now you'll uh, take a look here inside of, let's say button A, I'll move that somewhere useful. Uh, and here's what happens when button A gets pressed. First, I'm going to read the value of that angle variable we created in the setup block. Uh, initially, that was at 180. And if that value is less than 179, then we'll proceed. Well, this means that when the program starts, we can't use the A button because the servo is already pulled back uh, and pressing that, we're not gonna send it anywhere new. Um, so let me go ahead and press the forward button. And now this button will 
satisfy that con that condition of yeah the angle is less than 179 right now in fact it's at zero sending it in this direction is is to the zero angle um so when we press the a button if that condition is met then we proceed with showing an icon on the screen so i picked this sort of um cow skull looking thing which had kind of a backward arrow to it um then we are going to uh we have a couple options here you can very quickly move a servo to a a uh, angle and and this is the sort of servo sound you're familiar with from uh real mechanisms or especially in sci-fi movies is that and that's because it's moving as quick as it can it's got these high-pitched tiny little gears in there um I decided I wanted to finesse it a little more than that. So if we just set it to uh, to those angles, it's gonna move really quick. If we're trying to move something that's connected to that electromagnet, it might just get flung right off the end because it's moving so fast. So to slow this down, instead of going directly to set the servo angle with this block on its own, instead I'm setting it to uh, values incrementing by one. So we start at zero and then we go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all, all the way up to 179. So zero to 179, I think is where I'm going, or one to 179. Um, and we do this with this loop that goes through, it's a for loop that takes an index value and increments it one every time it goes through the loop. I'm telling it to go through the loop 180 times essentially from zero to 179. Each time we increase that angle variable value by one, so it's like plus i or plus one uh, then we set the servo that's plugged into port one to whatever that new angle is. So it'll be one, two, three, four, and so on. And one of the reasons this is taking a nice, uh, gentle journey from the starting to the ending angle is that I'm pausing for five milliseconds between every increment. And that is just enough time to sort of smooth out the the action, not so much that we get like a stuttering tick, 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 tick. So you can play around with those values to find something you like. Uh, so the B button essentially does the same thing, but in reverse. So if we open up uh, what this button does, it's going to say if the angle is greater than one, uh, meaning generally speaking, it's at 180. It's already been pulled all the way back. Then we're going to change the icon to this forward uh, shaped arrow icon. And same thing, we're going to run through an index. Uh, again, the index uh, wants to go from zero to 179. So we have to use a little bit of math to um, get it to do what we want, which is rather than just changing it to, the, uh, to add the index value, we subtract one from it. So that's in this direction, angle is minus one. In the other direction, angle is plus one. Uh, and that's otherwise it's it's identical so here we can see it in action we'll press the b button and now how about we'll try out our little um electromagnet and use this to carry the thing so i'm gonna press this button which will charge that electromagnet then i'll press the a button or the b button rather drove it over here and let go now it's charged my magnet a little bit, or my, my uh, screwdriver bit here. So it doesn't, doesn't really want to drop off, even though we've turned this on and off. It's, it's uh, developed its own charge there. So that doesn't work too well. We might, we might need to put a little piece of tape or something on there to, to prevent a little, uh, a little bit of that uh, strength. So it will probably come off if we just wiggle the servo enough. Let's try that. Nope, no, no luck. Okay, so here's an example. Let's let's try this. Let's uh, I'm gonna bring it back because that's the starting point. Leave it right there. Now I'm going to get rid of this uh, when we go in the forward direction, which is the B button. Let's get rid of this slow, gentle thing here. Uh, in fact, I'll just pull that out, and I will set the servo. to zero. Now oh, we can drag that back here. Okay, so now I'll save that uh, code to the, to the micro bit, download it to the micro bit. Okay, so now let's try the B button. It should fling that thing. Oh, it still didn't let go though. <laughs> it definitely really charged my... Uh... Okay. 
Oh, it's not changing angle though. Yeah, I've, I've really messed with it. All right, we'll, we'll undo that. So you can either reconstruct this block the way you had it, or we can uh, sometimes use this undo. Let's see, is that gonna get us there? Slowly it will, okay. It's gonna, it's gonna go through those values since I didn't type them in, but I used the slider. It registered a bunch of undo events. Put that back together. Okay, that's the way it was. Let's, let's redo it, download that. And uh, I'll try a different mic, uh, uh, screwdriver bit to see if we can get one that doesn't charge so easily. Let's see. Gotta be one I don't use much because this little screwdriver has a magnet built into it. So these are already a little predisposed to getting a charge. All right, we'll try this one. This one seems a little heavier. It's a little bit of a bigger bit. Okay, so grab it, move it, let go. No, it still doesn't want to let go. Fall off thing. <laughs> All right, here's what I was doing earlier uh, to ensure it is we're going to grab it by the end. And uh, now gravity will assist us a little more. Boop, and it drops off. There we go. Uh, so that uh, is the full set of functionality. Let's go ahead and uh, expand all these blocks, and then we can hit Format Code to organize things nicely. And I'll zoom out a bit. Uh, by the way, there were some questions I saw in the forums, uh, the Make Code forums the other day, about uh, the zooming and the panning in here. There are a few different ways you can do that. You can grab some scroll bars to pan your canvas around. Uh, you can also simply click the middle mouse button, which is usually a wheel on a, on a wheel mouse or a third button if it's a three button mouse. So if you click and hold that, you're in this sort of canvas uh, panning view. Uh, if you scroll, just regular scroll, it's only gonna give you vertical scroll. If you hold the shift, it'll give you horizontal scroll. If you hold down the con control key on a Windows box or the command key on a Mac, the uh, wheel becomes a zoom. And this is how I use it. It's just uh, middle mouse for dragging to pan and control or command middle mouse for zooming. And that's that's what I found uh, to be the most effective way for me to, to get around. It'll it'll only zoom out so far as to see every uh, item on your on your canvas in case you think you've lost something, but now with this right-click format code, you'll bring everything back into center nicely. Um, so let's see, I think that covers um, all of these wonderful uh, functions inside of the Cricut library. I uh, think if there's any I didn't use, it might just be sound. That, that's one of the few. Let's look in the Cricut library here. Oh, by the way, that zoom scale is dependent on the canvas. So if we want to see it big, we'll zoom in. There we go. Okay, so we have uh, the servos, which we used, the motors, which we used, drives, uh, signals. Now, one thing we didn't do uh, over in that motor area is a stepper, and that's a particular type of motor. You'll find them uh, very commonly in things like 3D printers uh, and CNC-based machines, but lots and lots of uh, oh, 2D printers, um, anything that's trying to use precise motions to, to move things around, uh, particularly with um, timing belts uh, wrapped around little toothed gears. Uh, those are stepper motors, and steppers can be set to very specific positions, uh, uh, rotational positions uh, very easily with speed control. So uh, maybe we'll take a look at those another time. I don't have any plugged in right now. Uh, and then the, the, the touch, uh, reading the touch uh, pads we did use. The, I mentioned the speaker, actually the speaker on the Cricut is not a separate piece of code. It's just simply an output if you're sending uh, sound over the analog output. So I believe in this case, if we use the music uh, tabs in make code for microbit. Uh, you could send through the speaker output of the um, the cricket, and I can't remember. I don't. Yeah, I believe there's a little amplifier there, so you could get maybe a, a larger speaker plugged in. It might be a uh, one watt amp, something like that. Uh, so that allows you to to use a bigger speaker than the the one that's built onto your device. Uh, let's see. I think that covers it. 
let me know if you have any questions or thoughts or clarifications you're looking for or ideas uh, over in the chat. I'm checking out the um, the Discord chat right now. I've got a question from uh, a user named I Love Claire Boucher who asks, are your demo programs available somewhere if we want to look at them later? That's an excellent question. And in fact, let's make this one available right now. What we'll do is I'm going to go up to share. Uh, and you can see here, I've named this project Cricket Microbit. Let's call it Make Code Live at the beginning. Make Code Live Cricket Microbit. I'll click Publish Project. And now you can point a camera at that QR code, uh, and that will open up your uh, browser into uh, this project in Make Code. You could also type in this URL, which is pretty unwieldy, but it's underscore 6V, capital V, H, capital P, G, F, capital P, R, I, S, H. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. Uh, and then I can also click copy, and that just copied that URL. And now I'll go ahead and paste that uh, inside of the various chats in case anyone wants them. Uh, so I can place that into, there it is, into the YouTube. Here it is into the Discord, and here it goes into the Mixer. Oh, and uh, hey, thank you, Cedar Grove over in Mixer says that uh, I believe it's a three watt Class D amplifier. Ah, oh, that is excellent. <laughs> he also said MakeCode runs the Scrapyard's magnet crane. That's it. I love the idea of big magnet. I gotta get a Matchbox car over here that's heavy, heavy enough to drop for sure when I pick it up. Um, so thank you so much for the question about sharing the code. Uh, that's the best time to do it is, is, uh, is when I'm, when I'm working in it and I'll remember, Hey, let's, let's go ahead and grab this code, especially if we've changed it over the course of, uh, over the course of the live stream. Now you've got a, a completely accurate up to the minute, uh, version of the code that you can, you can go and open and check out. Um, there are other ways that you can save the code when I hit download. Uh, it goes to the microcontroller. If I hit this save icon, you can see it just saved a hex file uh, in, uh, in the case of a micro bit, in the case of the uh, maker make code and Adafruit make code, you will get a UF2 file. Uh, but those are gonna be a self-contained file that can essentially be dragged onto the board or can be dragged up into a make code session and, and it'll open up the editor again. Uh, there are also ways, particularly with uh, Make Code Arcade, to save as a GitHub page, which gives you a really nice landing page that someone can click on and go and open up your game. Uh, so yeah, there's quite a few ways to save. Um, one thing I would like to dig into a little more sometime to see what the current state of things is, I was discussing this with a friend yesterday, is the actual working code when you don't go and do one of these downloads or shares, your actual working code is stored in your web browser as a, sort of a, a cache. Um, so it can be dangerous to clear the cache of your web browser if you haven't saved those files elsewhere. When we head to the home uh, of, of the make code, you'll see here's my file. Um, here are my most recent files that I've worked on. If I click on, uh, I believe the right arrow key it allows me to then click on a view all for projects. And here are all the projects that are saved in this browser's cache. So not, not too many of them. I think I, I updated it recently. Um, but I'd love to take a closer look at sort of the state of saving uh, just so that I can answer questions about that a little more intelligently. Uh, all right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you again so much for uh, choosing to spend your time here checking this uh, stuff out. Very excited about some of these new features in Make Code. Um, and I believe that's it. So please tune in to check out some of the other upcoming uh, Make Code live sessions here on the Microsoft Mixer. And uh, I will be back next week on Tuesday at this time, 12 o'clock Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern, with another Make Code live. Uh, and then if you're also interested in some related content, I have a uh, John Parks workshop show over on the Adafruit channels, uh, which happens on Thursday at one o'clock Pacific time, four o'clock Eastern. I'll also do a show and tell 
After that, we have a big Adafruit show and tell uh, this Wednesday evening. So you can go check the Adafruit blog for details on that. But there's a lot of different live streaming con content. Uh, 3D Hangouts with Noah and Pedro on Wednesdays, Ask an Engineer, sometimes there's the desk of Lady Ada, uh, and I'm probably leaving some out, so uh, pardon me if I am, but we have a lot of uh, great content over there. Uh, so that's it for today. Thank you so much. I'm John Park. This has been Make Code Live, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.